Okay, here we go. You're listening to Showtime with Coop. And I am so proud and honored. And I've got to read this guy's credentials because when I started reading up his credentials, he's more impressive. He was actually one of my favorite, favorite people, uh, <laughs> let alone one of the best persons that I ever had to guard in the NBA. But uh, it's George Gervin. The Showtime Podcast with Michael Cooper is brought to you by FanDuel, the exclusive wagering partner of the CLNS Media Network. And uh, girl, I'm going to read some of your credentials. I uh, uh, grew up with the Martin Luther King High School, average 31 and 20. I want you to get into that because I don't ever see you being a rebounder uh, with this high school there. Then transferred went to Evansville, Indiana and was a big time scorer there. And we're going to get into that because you did something there that uh, I want to talk about because I had a lot of times where I wanted to hit some people myself. Uh, but again, great uh, uh, in, uh, NBA credentials would be a nine time all star for the San Antonio Spurs, uh, four times NBA champion in 78 through the 80 and 82 season. Uh, his, his number 44 was retired and named to the 50, uh, 50 all-time greatest players and had probably the best, the best poster that you could ever want to have because Nike was just giving it to us back in the 80s, early 80s. They used to give us equipment and everything, but he had a poster, and I wish I had it. I don't have it here. Uh, it's upstairs, but George Iceman Gervin sitting on a block of ice with his legs crossed and just so smooth. George Gervin, my brother, and a friend of mine, and a coach. We coach in the big three. Uh, with uh, so we have been following each other around a lot. But Gerv, thank you so much for joining us, sir. Hey, cool. Good to be here, man. Good to see you, buddy. Uh, listen, we'll start right away like this. Tell us about uh, growing up in your high school in Detroit. Grew up in Detroit, Michigan, you know, um, raised by a single parent mom, raised six of us. Um, had two brothers that, that played before me um, that was real good uh, Detroit City ball players. My um, middle brother's uh, second brother, Claude, played with me at Martin Luther King High School when I was in school and, um, you know, went to high school and, you know, graduated from high school and, you know, and, and then went to college. Uh, you know, I went to Long Beach State first. That's right, with Tarkadian. Yeah, I went out to Tarkadian, you know, but I came out to L.A., man, and I couldn't stand it, man, so I went back home. <laughs> Kirk, hold up, hold up. You couldn't stand this nice weather out here, man? <laughs> man, I, you know, I ain't never been nowhere cool, but, I mean, you know, so it was hard for me to be away from home. Uh-huh. You know, I mean, all my friends, everybody I grew up with was back, you know, uh, in the Midwest. So I decided to go back home and go to Eastern Michigan. I went to Eastern Michigan University um, when I left Tark. You know, Tark came back to try to get me, man, but I didn't I didn't want to go back, man. I wanted to stay around my, you know, the people that I knew. So I, that's where I ended up going to play basketball at Eastern Michigan University. Oh, Ice, talk about how you got your nickname, the Ice Man. Now, I heard a lot of stories, but I want to hear the real story. Well, I really got a Patty Taylor, man, who's no longer here, man, my teammate, man. And, you know, me being from Detroit, man, and me having that, you know, distort Detroit flavor, man, where, you know, how you dress. And, you know, I wore the gaiters and big hats, drove Cadillacs and, you know. <laughs> Oh, you know, I mean, so like, girl, that sounds like a pimp, man, not a basketball well, player. <laughs> well, that's what you know. That's what he was, you know, trying to say that I was looking like a pimp, man. That's how he started calling me Ice, you know, Ice Man, man, and, and Iceberg Slim, man. But you know, wasn't nothing pimpish about me, man. So he just kept Ice. That's how I really got it, you know. I mean, with my style, man, and. You know, I mean, it's something that you know, man. That's that's who I am today, man. Ice, ice, man, man. But it, you know, it's you know, we all had nicknames back there, like Coop. You know, they got these corny nicknames now, nah, man. Totally. They, <laughs> but we took all the real ones. It's true. You guys have the best nicknames. Girl, I'm liking you, man. I'm love. I always in love with you, man. But uh, girl, talk about some of the the best players you played against growing up. Back in, in oh, well, high school and in college. Well, in high school, um, uh, Lindsey Harrison, who played at, um, uh, you know, um, 
What was so good not, about him? You ain't never heard of him, huh? No. You heard of Eric Money? Yes, I heard of Eric. You heard Cornell Norman? Yeah. You know, them two what guys. What made them that so I good, played. though, Ice? Huh? What made those guys so good? Well, Eric Money, you know, was a, you know, I thought was a real good point guard and he could score. Uh, Cornell Norman can just flat out shoot the basketball. I thought he had one of the best jump shots in the game. Uh, neither one of them really last that long, you know, but both of them was uh, pro material. Mm -hmm. You know, um, ain't too many other guys, man, I can think of, man, that from high school made the pros. You so, know? Kurt, what was the difference between you making it and them not making it? I think I was a more all-around player. Uh -huh. You know, they pretty much, you know, I think Eric was – pretty good. I think Cornell just can shoot it. He couldn't put it on the floor and shoot it. You know, I could put it on the floor and shoot it. And, you know, and then I had a variety of shots and stuff. So I think by being more fundamentally sound, I was fundamentally sound as a kid, mm -hmm. you know, so being fundamentally sound, I had room to grow and get better. You know, I mean, when you just one dimensional, like you just can shoot and you ain't practicing dribbling, or you ain't practicing, you know, uh, separation, getting away from guys to be able to shoot. I think that makes you weaker as you get older because guys, you start playing against guys that's just as big as you, but you don't have the skills to be able to separate yourself from them. I think that's what gave me my gift is that I had that fundamental when I was young. Now, did that come, did that come through uh, a family member or some of your coaches, or was that just your basketball IQ taking you to that level and understanding how to be fundamentally sound? No, I, I, I'd get that to my high school uh, assistant coach. Um, he worked with me every, you know, every day on footwork and fundamentals. You know, I think that's the key. Yeah. Well, was that, did you have aspirations of playing in the NBA, Gerber, or were you just playing basketball? Because like I tell people, my family didn't have the money to put me through college. So basketball was my way of getting an education, getting a degree, and, you know, being in the NBA, that came my senior year. I ain't had no intention on, I ain't think about being in the NBA. I never thought I was good enough to be in the NBA, you know, um, I, I just fell in love with the game. I didn't really start playing until I was about 13 or 14, and I was a pro at 19. So the game was just made for me. I mean, but I put my work in, you know. I, I, I fell in love with it late. But, you know, I had two brothers ahead of me, like I was saying. I had two brothers ahead of me that loved the game, and they worked their butt off, and, you know, and they got scholarships to go to college. And, you know, so I kind of followed in that footstep. Well, I didn't really do. I was there when the riots was in 67, you know, I mean, but, you know, we didn't understand it as a kid, you know, we didn't understand what they were rioting for. And, you know, it was the brutality, you know, you know, back then, because most riots usually start from post police brutality. You know, I didn't, didn't recognize that back then. I mean, uh, but, you know, I, I seen war, I seen ugliness, you know, um, I seen confusion you know, uh, coming up as a young man. But growing up in Detroit, man, and being able to compete with them guys in Detroit, I mean, if you can escape Detroit, man, with, you know, with your life and, and, and with your ability, man, you can go anywhere and play. So I had that kind of mentality when I left Detroit. You know what, Gerv, a lot of people don't understand when you come from the neighborhood. <laughs> That's like civil unrest every day because it's a fight to get down the street. I remember when I was growing up, uh, you know, the gang members wanted us to be in a gang and we wanted to be ourselves. My grandmother used to say, boy, don't you join no gang. So it was a hassle trying to go to school and pass them guys every day because you almost had to fight because they wanted you to be part of their gang. So uh, I bet it was the same way in Detroit coming up. Man, in the inner city, man, you know, I, I lived around the pimps and the hoes, you know. <laughs> so, so, you know, what the first car I bought, I bought a Cadillac. I mean, it's part of <laughs> It's part of the influence, man. I mean, it's, you know, I mean, I didn't have a dad around, so, you know, I didn't really have that kind of structure to understand that, man. Um, I mean, it's tough getting out of that inner city, man. I feel sorry for a lot of our, our kids because they are raised by single parents. They are easily influenced by the so-called good life, you know, the, the hustling and the, 
uh, uh, you know, the, the, you know, the women and, you know, I mean, a lot of the things that you can get lost and it can deter you from, you know, having a, a real career, man. So yeah, it was tough getting out of Detroit, man, but being able to survive it and being able to, to have a successful high school career, man. I mean, it, it was a blessing for me and, and it worked for me, man. And I was pretty good as a high school player. You know what, Gervin, you, you hit on something that I want to just touch a little bit more about. I, you know, grew up in a single family too. My dad left me, it was just my mom and my brother. And my mom was making, trying to make ends meet. She was a, a LVN nurse uh, going, you know, doing her thing. But she was, I was very fortunate and I want to hear your side of this as far as I had, you know, we're from a big family. You know, my mom is one of 10 kids and I was lucky to have some uncles that were kind of like my mentors. But as I started moving away from home, being more on the street playing basketball and going to play wherever they were playing, uh, my other mentor was my high school coach, George Turgeon, who just passed away uh, this past year. He's the one that kind of uh, grounded me as far as having that male figure in my life. I mean, I had it in my uncles at home, but he was another one outside the home and doing something that I love, which was basketball, because he was my high school coach, to still kind of keep me grounded and keep me focused. Who was that person for you? Well, I go, I say a Willie Murrayweather was one of the guys, my high school uh, coach, and then Dr. Sims, who was a doctor that always did things for young uh, African American kids, man, you know, and, 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 and them was my two mentors, you know, I mean, them was the two men in my life, you know, that took over that father image, you know, both of them still alive today, and both of them, you know, see what I grown to, you know, and, and still, you know, you know, proud of me today for, you know, having the success that I had as a uh, young person and not as an adult. So everybody needs a somebody, Coop, and uh, them two guys was my somebody. I heard that. So you go to Eastern Michigan, you have a great college career, and then you go to the, uh, the uh, Virginia Squires, right? In yeah, the I went to the Squires. What was it like playing in the ABA? <laughs> Man. Great, man. You know, I mean, you know, my route is like when I went to Eastern Michigan, man, you know, I got in that fight in Evansville. You were talking about Evansville. I got in a fight in Evansville, knocked out a guy named Jay Bacola. Why, Curve? Why? Why'd you hit him? Well, because, okay, we're we dealing with the 70s. We're talking about Indiana, you know, so, you know, we're talking about racism. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I mean, the referees was killing me, man. I mean, you know, they... The referees was actually cheating, you know, and then the, the guys was beating me like a drum, man. And then, you know, uh, me and a guy got into a little conversation and they threw me out the game, mm -hmm. you know. So by them throwing me out the game and the guy, you know, didn't throw him out. So I took him out. <laughs> so I hit that guy, Coop, I hit that guy so hard, man, and knocked him out, man. He, he was out, Coop with his eyes flickering. Hey, Coop, they had to take him out. They had to take him out with both his arms like this. It scared me to death. You know what? <laughs> I laugh, Gervin. I'm glad that you didn't kill this man or hurt him. In his but you know what? Those are the situations that people don't realize we had to come up through those times, man, because racism just wasn't outside the gym. <laughs> it came into the gym. Oh, uh, man, it was terrible, man. The way they was cheating, man, I mean, and you know, man, I, I, but, you know, for me, man, it changed my life, man. Uh -huh. You know, what it taught me, man, is that I don't care what going on with you, you uh -huh. can't lose your cool. Yeah. Hey, cool. If I would have killed the guy, I would have went to jail for the rest of my life. And there would have been know? no ice, man. There would have been no ice, man. There would have been no <laughs> yep. kids, man. There would have been yeah. no wife. There would so, have been no life. So after you hit him... Then uh, you obviously you got kicked out the rest of the season. I got kicked out. Of, I got kicked out off the team. <laughs> they threw me off the team, man, and then said that I might can play next year. Uh -huh. So I withdrew from school and joined the CBA, where I was playing on weekends. And I was oh. averaging thirty-eight. Johnny Red curse on me. Carl Earl Foreman, who owned the Virginia Squires. Say, uh -huh. y'all to take a look at this kid, flew me into Virginia, told me to shoot around. 
I shot around. I made 25 out of 28 threes, and he signed me on the spot. Wow. I'm the only guy in the history of basketball who had to shoot for his contract. <laughs> <laughs> well, this one of the best, girl. So some of the players, I mean, in, in the, the, the ABA at that time, which is the CBA, uh, Dr. J, uh, Bobby Jones, just to name a few. Come on, give me some more names. Well, I mean, the guy that I played with in Virginia? Yeah. I played with Doc. I played with Fatty. I played with George Irvine. I played with Swin Nader. You know, um, when I went to Virginia. But the guy, but the ABA, man, Really think about it, Coop. The ABA was a bunch of young guys, 21, uh -huh. 22, 23, that can score the basketball. We was averaging 110, 115 a night. You know, so, you know, we were young. We were vibrant, man. I mean, you know, I mean, it's that's the only way that we can entertain, you know, is put the ball in the basket. I mean, we didn't have that much money as for marketing. I mean, the ABA, without the ABA, I probably – don't know whether or not I would have made the NBA. Massachusetts, listen up. The wait is finally over. FanDuel, America's number one sports book, is now live in Boston. I have so many people that love me in Boston, and new customers in Massachusetts can get in on the action with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. Just sign up at FanDuel.com slash Boston. Finally, you can bet on all your favorite sports from the money line to point spreads to player props and more. Don't miss your chance to get $200 in bonus bets, win or lose. Visit FanDuel.com slash Boston. You know, so the ABA was big for me, man. Um, you know, I, 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 I was so thankful that there was an American Basketball League, man, with a lot of talent, man. And, you know, me being able to join the Virginia Squires and play with Dr. J, man, uh, you know, I think that really gave me a lot of confidence because me and Doc used to play one-on-one -on -one at the practice all the time. Uh-huh. So, you know, Doc kind of built up my confidence and, and self-esteem that let me know that, you know, I was a pro. So every time he see me now, man, he'll call me Rook right now. If he see me now, he say, what's up, Rook? <laughs> hey, so man, and I, I love it, man, because, you know, I, I appreciated my role back then as a rookie, you know, just having an opportunity to be a rookie pro. You know, so it's a lot different yesterday than what it is today. But, you know, I ain't got to deal with today basketball players. I mean, me and you coach the big three. We know how them knuckleheads is. Them guys, all them wannabes. When I was with the Squires and stuff, we was in Utah, and then they kept sending me telegrams because, you know, wasn't no internet and all that stuff back then. They were sending me telegrams and don't play for them. Now you're the property of the San Antonio Spurs. And, you know, I didn't know what was going on, so I called call my agent at that time, Irvin Weiner, and stuff. Say, what's going on? He said, man, we just traded you to San Antonio. So I got on a plane and flew into San Antonio, and um, Earl Foreman tried to renege on the deal. So they they put us – they sent – they went to court. So while they was going to court, they had to put me up. So I had to stay at the Hilton Del Rio, man, for a month. Until they, you know, until they went to trial and then the Spurs end up winning and stuff. And, you know, then I was able to play for the Spurs. But you're right, man. I was in the hotel for a month, man, not being able to do nothing, man. So it, it, it was rough for me during that time, man. But, you know, once they solved it, then, I, you know, I became a Spur. Uh, Gerb, uh, you arrived in San Antonio. Did you like the city? Hell no, man. Dude, I just come from Virginia. I, hey, hey, cool. I just come from Virginia. They got Hampton Institute, Norfolk State, and, and, and Richmond. <laughs> you know, all these black people. And then they send me to San Antonio where I ain't know nothing about San Antonio but the Alamo. <laughs> Who was the coach when you got there, Ice? Tom the Salky. Oh, okay. You like him? He was terrible. <laughs> Tom was terrible, man. I mean, he, he no longer here, so I can't talk about it, but he was terrible, man. Uh, Tom had that old slow offense, you know, he had that old slave mentality, you know, the <coughs> you do it like I do it or don't do it. I mean, I said, man, is this what I got myself into, man? Was this nut? 
And then they fired him the next year, man, because, you know, he was terrible, man. So, so Gervin, let me jump back a little bit because these guys make crazy money now. What was your, how much did you make your first contract? When I first signed the Lakers in 79, Gerv, I signed for thirty thousand dollars. I signed for fifty in, in the ABA. Oh, so you I way had, ahead I, of me from the get go. So you get to the Spurs, and what, what kind of money were you making there? Well, my last contract, I said like this, was eight hundred thousand a year. My last one. That's a drop in the bucket for the way these guys make money now. Yeah, right. Well, but then we didn't have no TV, man. I mean, yeah. you know, they get money because of TV. They ain't got. They don't get money because of skills. They get money because the market is right. And the things that we did to drive basketball to put it in the national attention. The only thing I can take credit for, Coop, and I'll give you the same credit, man, that we are the foundation, man, to – to 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 make this league grow, man, and they don't thank us enough. But you know that's not no here nor there, man. But you know these guys make a lot of money, man, cause it's because of they make it off our backs. Yeah. Today's game, man. Just think about it, man. They 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 can't shoot. <laughs> you, know, you know, I mean, just think about it, man. The the top guy that leading the league in scoring, man, he shoot forty times to get forty points. You know, and the percentage is awful. You know, um, the teams that win are the st teams that still play like the Lakers play. They play together, and that's the Spurs, you know, when they yeah. had Timmy. You know, I mean, so that ain't changed. It, it's only about five or six teams in the league anyway that's going to compete for the championship. You know, all the rest of them, man, is just there for entertainment. You know, it's five basketball teams left, man. Everything else is entertainment, man. So. Back when we played, in order to win, you had to have a good team. We never could be cooping them because they had a better team. No, they played better than us. When it was time to play better than, you know, to play better than us. Because we thought we could beat y'all. Yeah. You know, but we could never get over the hump. I mean, and then you guys had, what, three, four Hall of Famers? Yeah. But, Curve, you know what? All teams, and I tell people this when they try to compare the NBA today to back then, they don't realize it's just what you said. Right now, out of the whole NBA, you probably got five or six good teams. But when we were coming up, it was you guys in the West. Let's talk about the West. It was uh, us, the Lakers. It was you guys. It was Phoenix. Golden State was right there, but there was always that team to get over. Seattle Supersonics was a good team. Denver was, was a good team. Good you had a lot of good teams coming up back then. So, Gerv, you get with the Spurs. Uh, did things change when Stan Allback came, became the coach? Yeah, Stan was a good coach. You know, Stan, you know, Stan, we had fun. You know, he kept it fun. You know, when you keep it fun, you got a yeah. coach that keep it fun, man. You want to win for him, you know, and his leadership, man. I think that's where the success was. I think that's why y'all had a lot of success, man. Y'all had a coach that y'all liked. Yeah. You know, right. a, a coach that, you know, what y'all want to do, you know, I mean, yeah. that make it fun, you know. So Stan was that kind of guy. You know, when we played y'all, we had artists take the first shot and he took a three. <laughs> artist Gilmore, you know what I mean? Yeah. But that's the kind of coach he was and stuff, man, to kind of get everything started and stuff. So, yeah, yeah Stan was a good coach for us, man. Uh, Stan was one of my favorite. Uh, Doug Moe was my favorite. You know, but Stan also was one of my favorite coaches. Now, some of the legendary players you played with, Ice, Johnny Moore, uh, James Silas, Alvin Roberts. Mike uh, Mitchell. Obviously, you just mentioned Artis Gilmore, but the one that really, really got things done, and when we had to focus in, and one of our things was to stop you, man, the late, great Mike Mitchell, man. Talk a little bit about him. Man, he was a bad boy. Yeah, I probably had one of the best turnaround bank shots in the game, man. You know, That's way he in the game, yeah. I mean, he was he was special. You know, I can get 40, he can get 45. Or I can get 30, he can get 30. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, I had a good team, man. I mean, you know, with him, you know, uh, you know, at that at, at that forward, man, and me at the guard, man, and Johnny. You know, Johnny and I was probably the only two guys in the probably the history of the game that led the league in scoring and assists. And assists, yep. You know, I mean, so I had a good basketball team, man. You know, and Mike was a big part of it, man. And then we got artists and stuff and thought we could compete with you guys, man. Uh, you know, damn, man. I, 
we had a lot of success, man, in, in San Antonio, man. And, I, you know, and I'm proud of the guys that, that I played with, man. Uh, they wanted to win, and, man. It's just, you know, only one team can win of the year. Well, you know what, Gerb, I tell you what, winning is something special, but getting there and the teams that you played with, because I would love to have won all our championships, but usually the teams that, that we, when we didn't win the championship are guys that I'll always remember. And, you know, all my friendship with my team, teammates, we still last today. Uh, but again, those are some, some good ass teams you guys played. So we knew we couldn't take you guys for granted at all. Uh, one thing I want to mention, Gervin, you tell the story because I always tell a little bit about it. Is that uh, what was it, the '84 All Star Game when it was in LA and Pat Riley didn't select you to be on the All Star team? And the next game, you played you guys and you gave us what about 55 all kind of ways. <laughs> and I think this is when I really realized because you got that saying, I can finger roll that these kids don't really know about today. But you uh, kicked ass that day, Gerb. Talk about that game for a minute. Yeah, all I understand. I think that's a game, too, that Marvin Gaye sung the uh, national anthem. Yep. yep. You know what I mean? So, obviously, I was inspired with him because, you know, I kind of grew up with Marvin, and uh, I, I knew Marvin real well, man. But it was unfortunate, man. I don't know about your coach, man. Uh, I don't know why he didn't like me. You know, I ain't did nothing to him but try to get 50 on him. But, you know, he took, <laughs> he took me out of – he took me out of the all-star game, man. I mean, <laughs> for no apparent reason, you know, and I was real disappointed, man. Cause you know, I was rolling. He did me like that in the Indiana game too, man, that I thought I could have had a chance to win MVP, man. Uh -huh. So, you know, Pat, man, uh, you know, you know him better than I do, man, but you know, you're an asshole, man. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I don't I, I don't like him then and I don't like him now, man. Just because, man, he didn't have to be that way, man. So I wanted to whoop his ass, man, and I did. I I <laughs> no, you didn't whoop his ass. You didn't whoop his ass. You whooped my ass, and the rest well, of the yeah, well, was out there in the score. But every time I put it in the hole, I didn't even think of you, Coop. I was thinking of him. <laughs> David Thompson scored 73. Well, I need 59 do, to get it back. So what happened is I was leading the league and scoring all the way through the league until the last game of the season when me and David Thompson was close. You know, we were neck and neck just by percentage points. But it was the last game, and David was playing in Detroit, my hometown at the Cobo, and David ended up scoring 73 points and took over the scoring lead. So it was so happened, David played in the afternoon and I played at night in New Orleans. So the press called me up, Ice, Ice, David just scored 73. He took over the scoring lead. You need 59 in order to get it back. So we went over to the locker room, you know, and, and the coach, Doug Mo, say, man, that old, that old guy, Larry Brown and stuff, man, he, he, him and old David Thompson got together, man, and they tried to steal the the scoring title from Gervin. He was saying, man, he said, hey, hey y'all, let's see, can we let Gervin get it back? So the guy said, okay, okay, cool, because we was already in the playoffs, so we didn't have nothing to lose. So we went out, and I and we first quarter started, man, I missed my first six shots, man, called timeout, man. You know, and say, man, we ain't got to worry about this stuff, man. And all the guys kept saying, come on, Ice, man, come on, come on, man. So I went back out there, man, and, uh, you know, I heated up, man. I got 20 that first quarter. <laughs> now I'm rolling. You know, so the second quarter start, man, and I, I really start heating up, and I end up getting 33. So I had, I had 53 at half. Now I'm only need 59. <laughs> so the third quarter started, and I end up getting 60. You know, I end up getting 59. The, the trainer said, all right, girl, you got 59. You got it. I said, wait a minute, man. Let me get a couple of more points just in case they miscalculated. And that's how I got 63 points in 33 minutes to win my first scoring title. Gerb, you had 53 points in half. <laughs> yeah, 53 and a half. Man, remember, I, I got – I broke – David Thompson broke Will Chambers' record in the second quarter for 32 points because Will had 31. Uh-huh. Five hours later, I broke David Thompson's record with 33 in the second quarter to 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 break David Thompson record, wow. so I end up with fifty three. So Ice uh, scoring just came natural to you. I mean, 
that was just your thing. I mean, you could do that. I was fundamentally sound, man. I could use both hands. Uh huh. You, you know, I mean, so you know, I was, you know, I could shoot the jumper. I could take you to the hole, you know, and then I could read defense. Yeah. You know, you guard. You know, you guarded me a lot. Yeah. You know, I mean, or try to. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, you. You was one of the toughest guys to guard. I mean, Jamal, um, Bobby Jones, and T.R. Jones, T.R. Dunn, and Dennis Rodman was the, the guys that guarded me the hardest. I got a hard 30 on y'all. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you can laugh about it, Ice. I really like that. Ice, yeah, Coop, the Coop's part of the about it. where I have a lightning round. <laughs> I'm going to say a name and just give us a couple of words about this name I throw at you, okay? So I had Pat Riley in there, but we already know how you feel about him, so I'm not going to throw him in there. Uh, Stan Allback. Great coach. Tim Duncan. Best ever. Fundamentally? Fundamentally. Uh, Mike Mitchell. Missing. Michael Jordan. Uh, a hole. <laughs> last one. Well, last one. I, 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 I ain't gonna ask you to expound on that, but last but not least, Kobe Bryant. Clutch, Mr. Clutch. Curve, six seven. And you had the, the same identical body that I had. Six seven, a hundred and. 78, 180 pounds, how did you do it? Determination and skills. <laughs> <laughs> Last question, Gerd, for me. You know, uh, with this civil rest going, um, and again, I think you kind of touched on it a little bit, but you can add a little bit more. Um, what can we do as a country to be better and get better? Learn the Bible. Gerv, you know what? I say that too. I say that too in the sense of when we were growing up, and I tell people this all the time, I went to church from the day I was born, and this is one reason why I left and went to college, to when I went to University of Mexico at the age of 17. And I think in our culture, in our world today, and not just, uh, I think the, the Bible and religion, as well as going to church, is something that's missing in the family. Because I went to church on Sundays, all day, YPWW on Wednesdays, uh, something was happening on Thursday night. There was always things going on. You know, just think about it. I get ask you a question, man, and you can ask your audience. If the, if the devil was, if you believe in the devil and God, if the devil was running the earth, what would it be like? Wow. What do you think? That's a good, that a good question. Yeah. You want to know why we're having problems? Why? Who's running this thing? <laughs> That kind of, hey, that kind of make you think, don't you? Gervin, I'm too old to be thinking. I done burned up enough uh, brain cells up here. Now you want me to think some more and not like that. But, uh, Gerv, listen, uh, anything else you want to add? What you doing in the community? I know you got the George Gervin Foundation. How's it going? It's going good, man. I got charter school. I got two charter schools, the George Gervin Academy and the George Gervin Preparatory. I got the one in San Antonio. I'm going on my 24th year. Uh, my charter school from K to 12 and the one in Phoenix, I have one in Phoenix that is uh, from K to eighth grade. So I'm big in education. You know, I want to build a vocational school, man, because I'm not caught up, man, with all this college stuff, man, where everybody needs to go to college. I think the people that I grew up around and, uh, you know, and, and the community that I grew up around, we need to teach them skills. We need to teach them to be a plumber, electrician, you know, we need to teach them masonry, you know. Um, we need to teach them things, man, that they can own their own businesses, you know, not go to college. And you, I think college teach you to work for somebody else. I think if you get yourself a skill, you can work for, some, you can work for yourself and you can build your own wealth. That's what I would tell kids, man. So why did America take vocational schools out of high school? That's an important question. Look at us now because our kids don't have skills. Yeah. They want to be a rapper. They want to be a basketball player. Man, look at the percentage of us 
cool. It's almost like it ain't a percentage. You know, it's sad, man. I'm sad because, man, how America did it. But I'll ask you again, how would America be? How would the world be, man, if it was ran by the devil? <laughs> <laughs> So, Gerv, if somebody want to donate or reach out and help or any kind of way, what? how could they get in contact with your program? GeorgeGervin.org. That's the name. That's my website for my school. Okay. And AT pull it up, man. I think y'all would be impressed with it. Yeah. No. I'm an A, a, a school. Nah, because, you know, I hear a friend, man. I love him, man. He definitely, man, one of the best to ever do it. Everybody say he's the greatest of all time. I always say, what criteria are you using to say that? Because you can't forget about that brother that played with uh, Coop named Magic Johnson. Yeah. yeah. Or how about Kareem? And Kareem Abdul-Jabbar or Will Chamberlain or Bill Ru Ain't nobody got more championships than Bill Russell. Yeah. Or, or Sam Jones or Sat Sanders and, and Tim. I mean, so, you know, when you say all time, man, you know, come on, man. What is all time? You know, that's a, that's a thing that you can use for separation, man. Everybody played in their own era. Is Mike the best in his era? Hell yeah. You know, but he ain't the greatest of all time in my, you know, I, simply because I don't know what criteria you're using to say that. But he's a bad mother, shut your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> right, last question for me. Uh, of the 50 greatest players that they announced, name me one player that should be on there that's not. Bob McAdoo. Enough said, Ice. Love you, brother. Love you, man. Love you. Thank you so much, Ice. We appreciate it, man. Really, right. really appreciate it. CLNS History is brought to you by FanDuel, the exclusive wagering partner of the CLNS Media Network. 